Hey everybody. Um, so I've coached a few students now and I'm starting to see a pattern actually, which is obviously selecting for the type of person that seeks out coaching to improve. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of thoughtful players who understand a reasonable amount about GTO, uh, at least in some spots, they're studying, they're thinking about what kinds of hands both players have in each situation. And the main thing that I see dragging down a lot of win rates is really big bluffs and really big calls that uh, are made for subpar reasons. So, you know, the person will play fine for 200 hands, they'll have good opening ranges, they'll just kind of play in a way that makes sense, and then suddenly, you know, they'll put 100 big blinds in when they could have avoided it. Um, and I was like this too. Uh, in fact, I'm probably still like this. Um, obviously, each situation is going to be unique and different, and it's sometimes going to be hard to know, but I'm just going to give you an example to get started and then give you some uh, general heuristics that you might find helpful. Uh, okay, so here's an example situation that uh, I saw a player talk about in a session. So uh, this was something more or less like what the hand was. Uh, hero opens the hijack with ace of clubs, two of clubs, fine so far. The big blind, three bets to 12 big blinds. And um, we're going to assume that Hero doesn't think much of the big blind. Like maybe he thinks he's a, a bad player or they're all bad players at the stakes because they're playing $10 NL or whatever. Um, and so Hero, four bets to 25 big blinds. He thinks that people are going to overfold to a four bet and that um, he can outplay the villain uh, by putting in aggression. And then the villain calls. So if we start with just the assumption that uh, villains are overfolding to a four bet, we can pause for a second here and start to think about what this means about villains calling range, right? Villains calling range is pretty strong. So sometimes in these big pots, when they are disastrous, when they are punts, what's happening is that um, Hero makes some kind of a, a guess or a, a read uh, that might seem pretty logical, but then they sort of start to forget about that read like later on in the hand. So I'm going to four bet and villain is going to fold some hands that are supposed to call. And then when vil villain calls, hero kind of forgets what that does to the calling range, right? Where it becomes queens plus and ace king. Um, and then it's also not necessarily true that villain is over calling or over folding of the four bet. They might just be over calling to the four bet. Like we don't really know. They might be over shoving, and which is probably the worst of all of situations. Um, it's hard to say. Okay, so flop is queen of hearts, five of diamonds, three of diamonds. Sorry, it says rainbow, but we're gonna say that it's two tone. Uh, and uh, villain leads for twenty five percent of pot. Um, this is, I think, the kind of thing where people tend to punt more often is when they see villains do things that are, they think, theoretically unsound. Um, so first of all, just because you think something is theoretically unsound doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, your 10 NL opponents uh, are doing this because they've studied the spot like thoroughly. But, you know, if you actually look at um, Big Blind's response here, um, they get to donk like a little bit of everything if they want to. And does this mean that villain is like perfectly balanced or studied the spot? No. But what it does mean is that whatever hand they pick to do it with in this particular situation, it's actually not that bad, right? Um, really something is only terrible when you're like betting a size that is guaranteed to value cut yourself. Um, you know, it's kind of like the main, the main type of mistake that people are going to make that it's just like always wrong. Um, uh, in an individual hand. So, okay, so he leads for 25% of pot. And again, uh, this is like a spot that's not going to come up very often, right? Like hijack for betting the big blind um, at these stakes when you're not going to see this person again. Uh, so you, you, it's hard to know what kind of hand he's going to do this with, right? Um, but Hero doesn't think the villain gets to do this, and so he raises and villain calls, right? Um, what do we know about villain's calling range? I'm going to guess that it's very strong. Um, but maybe he's getting stubborn with a hand like ace-king. Maybe not. It's hard to say. 
if he is getting stubborn with a hand like ace king is he going to be more likely to make a stubborn call on the turn probably i mean if you're going to overcall on one street are you probably going to overcall on another I'd say that's a pretty fair guess um and this is kind of the problem with exploitative play in general right if you're ever just sort of guessing um so I think that exploitations, they, they come best and most often when you've played with someone for a long time, like uh, 20,000 hands or less than that if the mistake seems very obvious. But here, one individual hand, it's not enough. So then the turn is a five. Uh, the board has paired big blind checks. And then big blind thinks that he has ace five and the villain doesn't, so he decides to rep the five and shove. Um, this is another mistake I see a lot at small stakes, by the way, is narrowing in on a very small cluster of hands, usually nutted hands, rather than thinking about the entire range. So, you know, okay, yes, you're going to have two combos of ace five suited here, right? But really, with, uh, you know, a half size, a uh, half pot bet left behind, the nuts here is really like any queen. So, you know, how much of that do you have? You've probably got more like. I don't know, 10 combos or something if you're the big blind and um, you've got aces and kings and, and whatever, maybe ace queen off if you're the uh, the hijack. So the ace five suited is not really that relevant because <laughs> that's not the bulk of what you're trying to, you're hoping they'll call when you shove. Um, so yeah, narrowing in on this five, the five is actually basically a blank. It's, it's white noise. Yes, it's going to make, you know, two combos of your range stronger, but that's just not very important, right? Like a, we talk about a blank on a turn. Well, blank on a turn, can, they can have spiked a set. It's just not, not that important. Um, yeah, and so Hero shoves here with the Ace of Clubs, Two of Clubs, and I didn't put what he, get call, what he gets called by because I'm making this spot up, basically, and um, obviously we shouldn't be results-oriented, right? Like even if um, the big blind folded here... Um, we're not going to have the spot for Zim again very often, uh, if ever. We might not see this player again, and we just have no idea. Like, they could have misclicked. We have we have no idea. I think you're going to get called here really, really often. <laughs> I would not be surprised to see you get called here by Ace-King uh, at 10 NL or 5 NL. Um, and I would not be surprised to see the big blind show up with Aces and Kings and Queens a uh, really high percentage of the time as well. Uh, you know, they donk maybe because they feel like their hand needs protection, and um, that's just like it. Uh, basically, uh, the general heuristic I'm going to give is bluff weaker players in smaller pots instead of bigger pots. But sometimes in 3-bit pots as well. Um, players are very bad when they're weak at balancing checkback ranges. Um, I don't know, if you play live... <laughs> you've probably uh, seen a player, a bad player, lecture another player before about giving a free card, right? So this is a misconception that like a lot of players have is, oh, you know, you, you let me spike a, a straight on the turn like you should have bet and then I would have folded. Um, people are really protection obsessed and it makes sense. You, the, the worst feeling in poker is getting coolered, uh, the, having the best hand and then um, ending up with the worst hand when it could have been avoided. So people are naturally very afraid of this. And this leads players to um, bet with their good hands at too high a frequency um, so that they can avoid this situation happening. And what happens when you bet all of your good hands is that the hands you check end up being trash. So a really simple way of finding good opportunities to bluff is look for situations where um, you believe the villain is going to bet their good hands. And so when they check, you have a natural bluffing opportunity. I don't want to speak too generally because each player is going to be different. And I, I think the most important thing to get good at exploiting is observe each player for yourself and start thinking how to exploit them on an individual level. But this is a general tip. Uh, yeah, so get creative in small pots more often than big ones. You know, if you see a player donk in a small pot, uh, it is more 
it is better to to start thinking creatively about how to win the pot because basically when the pot gets really big people tend to have good hands you know even their 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 semi bluffs right their their kind of bluffs tend to be high equity and uh that just that just kind of makes sense on the face of it right and um when uh the players have strong hands they don't like to fold right uh you know if the player flops the nut straight and the board pairs on the river and you have to pair and you think that you can rep a boat players don't like to fold the nut straight it's it's pretty simple right they don't want to get bluffed and they just kind of can't believe they could be that unlucky and they just want to call um we have all been in a situation before where we have a strong hand and when we face a lot of aggression it's never easy to fold right um it's just pretty simple uh whereas in a small pot you face a lot of aggression kind of the opposite principle applies like am i really going to risk half of my stack here with middle pair um you know i haven't put a lot of money in and this person's just piling it in i don't want to be wrong and lose this money that could have been avoided so basically people are afraid to get bluffed off in big pots and people are afraid to call off in small pots um I think generally it's more productive to think about the fish's range than your own. So sometimes people will think like, "Oh, I'm never going to get to the river here with a weaker hand than this," or, um, you know, "I don't have to bluff very often, but these are ideal blockers," or um, this type of thing. Uh, you know, blockers and stuff like that—they only really matter when play is getting pretty close to optimal. Um, it's really frequencies that matter more, um, and when your opponent's frequencies are way off, uh, you have a more obvious way of exploiting them. So, you know, like if a player is not meeting minimum defense frequency, for example, then all of your bluffs are profitable. It doesn't really matter what your blockers are. Um, and so in that regard, I think that once you get to know a player and you understand them a little bit better, if they're a weak player, which is the kind of player where we're trying to get out of line against, you know, in these punts versus big plays, then I think you're better off starting to make reads on their hands than think about where you are in your range and all of that stuff, because they're not going to be thinking about that, right? Um, and then this is probably one you've heard before, but it's just like pretty, pretty much common knowledge at this point. People are not comfortable facing over bets. Um, it's something the solver does a lot. It's something you should learn how to do and you should study. Um, but when we're starting out, we don't really understand overbetting. And when we don't understand it and we just kind of assume that we would never do it, be comfortable doing it with a bluff, then people, I think, just tend to assume it's pretty nutted. So overbetting is good. It's good with your good hands as well for different reasons. But uh, yeah, okay, so that's just a basic breakdown of um, some ideas about what leads to punts. And... Uh, you know, I think there's similar work that people have to do psychologically to just think about when they're in a big pot, uh, whether they're pulling the trigger on a bluff because they think that it's good or because they just want to win the hand. So that's something you want to consider as well. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And I hope that you found the video helpful. Okay, take care, everyone.